Well, thank you all for uh, uh, participation. And it was uh, basically a great momentum and great pleasure to have all of you together uh, with us. And I would like to uh, say okay. thanks to all of you for your participation. And I think it is, uh, as I said, a great momentum to discuss because as we, we can see very clearly, most of our colleagues from the science, they, they, are, they become silent when some kind of the conflict is on the horizon. So what we have today in Europe, we have uh, three major unintegrated territories uh, like uh, Ukraine, Serbia with Kosovo, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And exactly on these three places and maybe even widen the conflict between Russia and US and US partners and allies will occur. The conflict is already in the air, but just what we are waiting now, it's clear military uh, interventions or military conflict with the all military uh, sense and, uh, and use of, uh, of, of power as well. So. It is my great pleasure, of course, to invite all of you to think and to uh, expose your view uh, for the for, for the conf conflict that it is already in the air in Ukraine. And of course, uh, we are we look for some kind of the scientific solutions, how to prevent, how to inform, and how and what will be the rule of scientific diplomacy. As I understand, all of you, you are representing not only yourself, but also institutions that you are coming from. And uh, 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 let's say we would like to brainstorm all those from UN, from EU, uh, uh, very invisible international institutions with, of course, with uh, due respect, with some kind of the moves and steps. But we don't see you EU observers on the border between Russia and Ukraine. We don't see the strong UN message because maybe UN is paralyzed. That's why we need to think about some kind of the change there. But definitely, I think with all this brainstorm and all these brains gathering together today on this conference, definitely we might suggest some kind of the solution which will pacify aggressive policy of Russia and satisfy territorial integrity of uh, Ukraine. Without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to Professor Shlomo Shapira as our today key keynote speaker. Professor Shlomo, uh, microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Darko, and thank you to the organizers of this uh, very, very timely conference. I don't think it could have been more timely than today uh, to plan something a month or more in advance to hit exactly the right time, the, the, the peak of the, of the crisis uh, is, is masterly. So uh, well done. It's already the second time we are meeting in this forum, more or less, uh, in, in kind of a monthly meeting, and uh, I find it very, very useful. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to, to briefly address you. Uh, and to all the participants across the globe, some are in U, uh, European time, some are in the US time, different time zones from China to the US. So thank you very much. Um, I, I will share a brief presentation, not because I need a presentation in order to speak about this, but in, because I think that images are as important as words when we look at this stage of the, uh, of the conflict. And I will try to, in the 10 minutes that I have, I will try to set the stage by defining the, the overall borders of the conflict, what, to, to try to answer basically three questions. The first is why Ukraine now? The, the uh, crisis or the conflict in the Ukraine has been going on for almost a decade. Why is it now? Why are we sitting and discussing it now? Why is the crisis reaching its peak exactly now? The second issue I will try to address very briefly are what are the core issues of the crisis? It is obviously a crisis about Russia and the Ukraine, but I think we would all agree that the the borders, the boundaries of this crisis are much wider. And I'll try and very quickly answer that question. And the third issue is I'll talk about the limitations of Russian military threats on the one side and European military responses on the other. So let me share uh, my, my very small presentation um, with you. And I, I will leave it like that. I will not open the presentation uh, completely because I have a small screen here. Um, but um, why Ukraine now? Let's ask ourselves, why Ukraine now? And I'll, I'll give you five seconds to look at these pictures. Anyone looking at the picture on the right, uh, perhaps uh, people slightly older than us, would immediately recognize this image. These are the last uh, American troops withdrawing from the American embassy in Saigon in South Vietnam. 
back in 1975. The picture on the left is last summer, the American withdrawal from Kabul. Um, and it's not just the, 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 the similar angle of picture. It invokes, it invokes similar feelings and it invokes similar reactions. Um, why Ukraine now? We cannot, uh, 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 we cannot look at the crisis now without looking at the Western withdrawal or escape from uh, Kabul, from Afghanistan, after 20 years of war, very, very, uh, um, I would say, war of attrition with a lot of cost and a lot of very heavy price in terms of blood, in terms of economic abilities. Uh, and then basically uh, it all comes to an end very visually, very quickly, um, with the collapse of the so-called Afghan National Army within a few hours. Uh, and the same Taliban taking over Afghanistan, who were in control of it before the war. Um, and people in Moscow sit and watch these pictures as their fathers or grandfathers sat and watched the American withdrawal, very, very hasty withdrawal from, from Saigon. Um, and this type of withdrawal certainly signals weakness. This, these type of pictures, the last helicopter leaving from the roof of the embassy, it's no coincidence that it brings about these pictures, fairly similar pictures. On the left, the Soviet forces invading Afghanistan in, back in 1979, and on the right, Soviet forces massing outside the border of the Ukraine in the last couple of weeks. Global reactors, if we learn anything about history, of securities. Global reactors, global actors react to global developments. There is no power vacuum. As soon as the Russians felt a weakness of the United States in one region of the world, they were ready to pounce in another. It is no mistake, it's no, it's no coincidence that the Russians invaded Afghanistan after the fall of South Vietnam and the American withdrawal. And it's no coincidence that we are now sitting in front of a crisis in the Ukraine a few months after the American, the Western withdrawal from Kabul. Signals of weakness lead to exploitation. So that is, for me, of course, together with the COVID-19 crisis, but the COVID-19 has been going on for two years, and now we have a few more abilities to deal with it. But the, the weakness that was shown by the West in this very hasty, very bumbling withdrawal, very sudden withdrawal from Afghanistan and the military collapse of Afghanistan within a few hours uh, certainly reinforced the voices in Russia which say the West is a paper tiger, as they did say in 1979, and we can expand ourselves territorially, militarily um, after this show of, of weakness. What are the core issues? in the crisis. Well, obviously, it's a crisis about Euro Ukrainian territorial integrity. It is very clear to us. We see the Russian forces uh, that are just outside across the border. Intelligence services talk about 100,000 uh, troops. We see the rows of tanks and so on and so forth. Even if part of it is deception, uh, it's very clear that there are very strong Russian forces that are threatening Ukrainian territorial integrity. But we would all agree that it's wider than that. Russia is clearly drawing a line to NATO's eastern expansion. President Putin said that several times in the last few weeks in speeches and in a meeting, very revealing meeting with journalists. He said this is time to draw the line. NATO has expanded, expanded in the Baltics, and expanded in, in Poland and Eastern Europe. And now we want to draw the line. For us, this is the red line. We are also looking at the uh, threat to energy supplies, in this case gas, from Russia to Europe, which is exposing really the European, especially the winter, dependence on Russian gas. Um, much of the renewable energies that uh, were invested in in Western Europe in the last years are solar or wind powered. Wind is okay in the winter, there's a little bit less, but solar energy is fairly useless in the winter. So, of course, you are more and more dependent on gas. But we need to ask ourselves three, three further questions on the wider framework of, of the crisis. Is this crisis upsetting the balance of power in Europe? Was there a balance of power in Europe over the last three decades? Well, 
I would say there was certainly a balance of power, even though many people would not use this term. The balance of power was that the Russian power in Europe has diminished substantially in the early 90s, and people were talking about the dividend of peace and many political developments which were not possible beforehand uh, took place in Europe. And that is also much of the success of the euro, uh, various aspects of European integration, even the Brexit, even, even certainly the Brexit, which would have been unthinkable in, in terms of the Cold War. But are we seeing a new Cold War or a hot war? Well, many people would say that the Cold War was cold because it never really became a fighting. There was no kinetic fighting. There was no nuclear fighting. But ask the people of Vietnam, ask the people of Angola, ask the people of Egypt or Israel or Syria, ask the people in various proxy wars around the world, was the Cold War hot for them? Certainly, it certainly was. Um, and therefore, I think any talk about the so-called new Cold War has to take into account that it can very quickly turn into a hot war. We have seen conflicts and wars that nobody wanted. Anyone who read about the folly of the outbreak of the First World War is very familiar with the case in which most leaderships in Europe did not want the First World War to break out, but of course a relatively small thing spiraled everything out of control. And the situation that we have now, so many Russian forces at the border of the Ukraine means that anything, anything can really happen. What happens if a plane is shot down by mistake? What happens if there is a border incident that nobody from the top plans? And are we going to see that rising even into the level of a nuclear crisis? Um, I will say I will address limitations of military threats from both sides in in the two three minutes that I have uh, left. Um, the Russian military does look and does present a very formidable picture. We see the rows of tanks, we see the rows of soldiers jumping, shooting, doing training and maneuvers and so on. But we have to remember one other general, and that is called General Winter. And lessons of, of great warlords from Napoleon through World War II and the Winter War with Finland. In the year 1939 to 41, Finland, a very small country, both in terms of geography and population, was able to beat off the Russians in the Winter War because of their motivation and because of the winter. The winter is not a good time to start a war, and there is a lot of limitations in that. So maybe we will see the Russians maintaining a certain posture on the border until the, the, the weather uh, is better, maybe May, early June, something like that. The second limitation is the geography of the Ukraine. I don't know how many of you looked at a detailed map of the Ukraine recently. Ukraine is a very large country with rivers to cross, with difficult geography to cross, with problems for any invading army in terms of logistics, in terms of the logistics that would be very much defined to small, narrow roads along hundreds of kilometers, very easy to attack, very easy to block. Similar problems that the Russians had in Afghanistan. Add to that the geography and the weather, and the third element, the moral and the motivation of the troops. I should have placed a large question mark behind that. I don't think any Russian soldier thinks he is going to defend Moscow by attacking Kiev. Um, there is an issue of moral and motivation of the troops. I think it's too early to look into that. I think it's something that the Russians are looking at very carefully. On the other side, we have also very severe limitations of European military responses, and this crisis exposed these limitations. First and foremost, the military weakness of the European Union. The so-called dividend of peace that was very popular in the 1990s as another word for cutting down conventional military forces was obviously taken to an extreme. Military forces in Europe are beyond the red line. They're, not, they're, they're already much below the red line. Um, European armies became smaller and smaller, not just in terms of number, but in terms of capacities, in terms of air power, in terms of tanks. The British Army, and that is no secret, the British Army has more horses than tanks. 
ready for frontline service. It's something that is worrying, especially if we take into account that European combat units are tied up in subcritical missions, such as the mission in Mali. I am not debating whether the mission in Mali is important or less than important, but it is certainly subcritical in terms of critical interests of security for the European Union. On top of that, we have the fact that military capacities everywhere are degraded due to COVID-19. And I was searching for statistics, how many percent of soldiers in the German army, in the French army, in the Polish army are sick with COVID. It's very difficult to get reliable sources, but if we look at the fact that armies reflect the population, then a certain substantial percentage of military capabilities have been degraded and are degraded over the last few weeks and will be so because of COVID-19. So we see problems and limitations on both sides. I tried in 10 minutes to draw the wide alliance um, of the conflict. We have fascinating papers uh, to date that will go into various aspects and details of the, uh, of the uh, conflict. So thank you, everyone, and uh, let's have a great conference. Thank you. Thank you, Shlomo, so much. It was very inspirative. And without any further ado, I would like to call Professor Vasil, Vasil Zapatinsky. Uh, Professor Zapatinsky, floor is yours, Vasil. Good day. I have a short presentation a moment. Dear colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to speak with the International Scientific Conference Potential Russian-Ukrainian Conflict and Possible Geopolitical Consequences. My report, Russian-Ukrainian Conflict, a view from Ukraine. Slide 18. The current state of Ukrainian-Russian relations. Ukraine's relations with Russia are characterized by long-term confrontation in the political, economic, informational and psychological spheres. Its current stage began in 2003, and the next escalation occurred in 2013 to 2014, when Russia illegally occupied Crimea. In Donetsk and Luhansk regions, this confrontation with Russia is manifested in the form of hostilities. As a result of hostilities, more than 13,000 Ukrainians and many citizens of the Russian Federation died. C. Russian leadership does not want to enter into direct talks between Ukraine and Russia. Slide 19. Economy. Economic ties between Ukraine and Russia are very weak but not severed. The economic war continues and deepens. Trade between Ukraine and Russia is declining. In 2015, Russia imposed an embargo on products from Ukraine. The Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine extended, since 2016, the ban on the import of a number of goods from Russia into Ukraine until January 1, 2023. These are tractors, fertilizers, medicines, paper, as well as certain categories of products, meat, fish, coffee, confectionery, chocolate, cookies, candy. This crisis must be seen in the context of Russia's policy on gas tariffs to Europe and the launch of Nord Stream 2 and the impact on gas prices in Europe. It should be noted that the transit of gas through Russia will not stop completely. According to official data, the average daily transit of natural gas through the gas transmission system of Ukraine on January the 1st to the 16th, 2022 is 52.4 million cubic meters, M, which is the minimum for the last four years. Slide 20. Human flows. The flow of people crossing the state border is regulated by bilateral agreements between Ukraine and Russia. There are no specific restrictions on crossing the border with Russia today due to the conflict. The border of Ukraine is being crossed into the temporarily occupied territories of Luhansk, Donetsk region and Crimea. Slide 21. War in Ukraine. 
Eight years of war, the war in Ukraine began with the capture of Crimea by Russia. The conquest began on February 20, 2014. At that moment, the revolution of dignity was coming to an end in Ukraine. Russia took advantage of the moment of transfer of power in Ukraine. Ukrainian forces in Crimea were blocked by the military without identification. Management of the armed forces of Ukraine in Crimea was violated at this time. Russia has sent additional troops to Crimea at the suggestion of Russian President Putin. In Crimea, a referendum was organized on the transition to Russian jurisdiction in violation of existing laws. On Putin signed an agreement on the transition of Crimea to Russia, and on March 21, the Russian Federation Council ratified the document. It is believed that Russia has long been preparing to seize Crimea. Slide 22. The next stage of the war unfolded in eastern Ukraine on April 12, 2014. Russian special groups organized collaborators from the civilian population and law enforcement agencies. Part of Donetsk and Luhansk blasts were occupied. Presence and aggressive behavior of Russian troops in the occupied Ukrainian territories is a fact. Slide 23. Russia does not recognize its involvement in the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Russia is showing outright deception in the media. Therefore, the war is considered undeclared. Legally, the anti-terrorist operation, 2014-2018, and the joint forces operation, since 2018, are underway in eastern Ukraine. Slide 24. Heroism of Ukrainian soldiers. Cyborgs are Ukrainian servicemen who took part in the defense of the Donetsk airport during the war in eastern Ukraine, May 26, 2014, January 22, 2015, and other battles. The defense of Donetsk airport lasted 242 days. 100 Ukrainian soldiers were killed and about 300 were wounded. January 20th, day of honoring the defenders of Donetsk Airport, Cyborg Remembrance Day. Slide 25. The psychological and social pressure of Russia on Ukraine and other countries Russia is conducting a psychological campaign against Ukraine. Every day, the Russian media spread fakes and lies about Ukraine and Ukrainians. Russia is inspiring its people that Ukraine is an incomprehensible country that has never existed before. Russians are convinced that there is a political and economic collapse in Ukraine food and energy crisis. Russian media say that Ukrainians are fascists and must be destroyed. Russia continues to Russify the population in the occupied territories. Russia is actively granting Russian citizenship to Ukrainians in the temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine. Russia claims to protect Russians and the Russian-speaking population. Russia is waging a hybrid war with Ukraine. The conflict between Russia and Ukraine is a classic example of chauvinism. This conflict is based on Russia's imperial roots, which it is trying to show as a conflict of nations and peoples. However, the Russian leadership does not take into account that Russia is home to a large number of Ukrainians who do not support imperial policy. Slide 26. Prospects for further development of Russian-Ukrainian relations Russia will never give up its territorial claims to Ukrainian territory. Russia will prepare various plans for the partial or complete capture of Ukraine. Russia will continue to play the card of Ukraine on the world political arena to obtain the necessary political and economic benefits. Russia will continue to seek to destabilize the political, social and economic situation in Ukraine with a view to further aggression under the banner of assistance. Russia's most plausible plan is a policy of discrediting Ukraine in the world community, limiting its capabilities, joining NATO, etc., destabilizing the internal situation. An 
attempt to gradually seize the territory of Ukraine under various pretexts. Slide 27. War or peace? Russia's open military action against Ukraine is unlikely because its consequences are difficult to predict. From the standpoint of logic, from an economic, political and social point of view, Russia's war against Ukraine will not benefit Russia. Russia wants to show that its actions are unpunished and no one has the right to dictate what to do. Russia's involvement in the conflicts in Georgia and Syria, the seizure of Crimea and the war in eastern Ukraine are examples of this. Russia's open war with Ukraine will satisfy Russia's imperial ambitions. Imperial ambitions can be put above logic. Slide 28. A change in Russia's policy towards Ukraine is possible in the case of radical change in the political system in Russia, the emergence of a threat to Russia that will be much more serious than the issue of Ukraine. If Russia needs Ukraine as an ally, the disintegration of the Russian Federation into separate countries will take place. Slide 29. Conclusions Ukraine is interested in ending the confrontation with Russia. Ukraine does not want a war with Russia. To show that about 50% of Ukrainians are ready to put up active resistance and 33.3% of Ukrainians surveyed are ready to defend the country with weapons in hand in the event of a direct Russian invasion. Ukraine will survive. Thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you, Vasily. Uh, not only that we learn a lot, but also you bring us new light of artificial intelligence in presentation. I don't know for you other guys, but for me, it was the first time uh, to have this experience with artificial. Uh, uh, and it will take time to, you know, for all of us to accommodate with, uh, with, uh, with the new technologies. So thank you so much once again. And uh, next on our list is Professor Jan Anthony. Professor Jan Anthony, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation. I hope you can hear me. Um, what I wanted to do was look a little bit more closely at the military dimensions of the question that was posed at the beginning of why now. Um, I don't think there's much ambiguity about the broader question of why there is a conflict, the Russian colleagues have been extremely explicit about what their objectives are. But if you look at it objectively, Ukraine and also Georgia are no closer to NATO membership today than they were in 2008 uh, when the meeting took place in Bucharest. So why now? Um, I think you can obviously look at political factors and, and I wouldn't want to downplay those. Those include domestic factors in Russia and Belarus. Um, Mr. Putin from 2023 is going to be very absorbed with making sure that he completes the process of becoming president for life. Based on the constitutional change, he will still have to actually implement um, the process of getting himself uh, re-elected. And in Belarus, you have the constitutional process, uh, again, to try and maintain the existing power structure. We don't know what the outcome of that will be. So. Uh, certainly, there are domestic factors, which mean that from 2023, internal affairs will be uh, the highest priority. Um, you also have distractions in Western countries, the US midterm elections, a new German government, um, French elections coming up. So Western countries also, to a certain extent, distracted by internal factors. But um, I'm going to try and argue that there's also a military argument for why um, things are coming to a head now. And that is the juxtaposition of the way in which Russia has implemented military reforms and modernization. Um, we see a continuous growth in Russian military spending from roughly the time when power was transferred to President Putin. Um, but from 2016, we see a kind of leveling off of uh, Russia's um, resource allocation to the military. We don't know whether that will continue, but that's been the tendency for the last couple of years at least. 
So now there is a broadly stable share of GDP um, and a broadly stable share of government spending on defense. Um, the process which was announced as part of the reform program to modernize the equipment of the armed forces um, has come a long way in most of the sectors, including not only strategic nuclear, but also conventional forces. Um, we've seen the implementation of military reforms which have created um, new formations around the Black Sea, consolidation of the Southern Military District um, with the exercising of the um, new approach, so-called joint inter-service combat operations, which have now been exercised over several years. Um, and also a set of exercises which prepare for activity across an integrated strategic space from the Arctic to the Black Sea. And you could argue even beyond that with the recent operations in the Eastern Mediterranean um, extending to Syria. Uh, so Russia has come a long way in implementing a reform and modernization program, whereas NATO is at a relatively early stage of implementing what are quite ambitious plans if you compare military preparations with what we saw in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, there's been a very significant increase in the defense effort in Europe, for sure, uh, more than 20% increase in real terms um, since 2014, and a much larger increase in real terms in, in a NATO member, Turkey, with obvious relevance for Black Sea um, calculations. Um, we've seen a new military strategy uh, in 2019, including the revision of war plans, uh, something which NATO paid very little attention to in the 1990s and 2000s, when the priority was uh, missions further away from Europe. Um, we've also seen uh, the um, increased capability of the NATO response force and the so-called 430s being able to mobilize a very significant force within 30 days. Um, we've seen changes in command structures and the revitalization of national commands, um, including European command of the United States and the US Second Fleet being reconfigured as war fighting commands. So certainly things have happened since 2014, but there's still a lot to do. Um, the main sustainable NATO force is not anticipated to be in place until after 2030. And a lot of that will depend on um, decisions taken by Germany. Uh, Germany is expected to be, or to provide the backbone, if you like, of um, the main sustainable force that NATO would use to support the NATO response force, which would be mobilized more quickly. Um, the changes in the uh, Russian missile forces, including before, but now probably also accelerated after the termination of the INF Treaty, mean that NATO is going to have to rethink its approach to its integrated air and missile defense to take account of Russian capabilities, which can now reach the whole of NATO Europe uh, with intermediate range missiles. Um, there has been work done to implement the um, military strategy, which is based on reinforcement, a relatively small forward-based forces, which would be rapidly reinforced in a crisis. Um, work has been done to think through military mobility, but none of what I've mentioned in the previous couple of minutes has really been properly exercised. The major exercises which were planned for 2020 and 2021, the Defender particularly, the Defender exercise, were completely disrupted by COVID. Um, and if you talk to military people, they will normally tell you that a capability which hasn't been exercised can't be considered to exist. Um, so we could say that um, Russia has reached, in a way, the zenith of its power, uh, whereas NATO is at a very early stage of implementing um, quite far-reaching plans for reform and modernization. So from this point on, things just get worse and worse for Russia in purely military terms. Um, can Russia implement further increases in military effort? Um, it depends to a certain extent on economic performance, of course. 
Uh, and it also depends to a certain extent on how the industrial science and technology partnership with China evolves. Uh, because NATO's approach is to a degree transformational. It's not just an increase in numbers, it's also moving to a next generation of equipment and new concepts for how that equipment will be used. Um, so whether or not Russia is able to follow that pattern or how it would respond to this transformational agenda is unclear. Um, also, because of the current crisis, it's possible at least that NATO will make further changes to its military strategy, moving from a strategy based on rapid reinforcement of small forward presence to um, something more like a sort of comprehensive forward deployment. And you already see some moves in that direction with talk about increasing the size of uh, US and NATO forces in Romania, in Bulgaria. Um, the fact that the NATO response force, if it's mobilized, will move to Poland. Um, so you begin to see the shape of what might be a larger forward presence. Um, just to close, um, well, actually, maybe one more sentence. Uh, what will be the impact on countries which at the moment have a close relationship with NATO, but are not members of the alliance? Of course, one direct consequence of the current crisis is that Ukraine and NATO are integrating their military capabilities, security and intelligence forces in a way which is uh, accelerating. Uh, but you also have a new momentum in the discussion in both Finland and Sweden about whether now is the time to move from um, outside the alliance but close partnership to membership. Um, What's happening in Ukraine is underlining the difference between having and not having so-called Article 5 guarantees. Um, finally, just a word on whether there's an alternative approach, uh, for example, restraint through arms control. Uh, this is something which NATO has offered to Russia as an area for future conversations, although the vast majority of what Russia proposed in December has been rejected. Uh, arms control is seen as an area of potential discussion. But there's very little incentive, it seems to me, to make significant changes in the nuclear or the conventional arms control field. Um, Russia and the United States are both broadly content with the current strategic nuclear picture, and making significant reductions would also be very unlikely in the context of trying to understand China's nuclear policies. Um, the transformational trajectory of NATO modernization uh, consolidates the salience of nuclear weapons for Russia. So it's very unlikely that Russia would be willing to seriously discuss non-strategic nuclear weapons at this time. Uh, the new strategic geography um, makes it very difficult to return to a CFE-type conventional arms agreement, which was based on broad symmetry and parity, which simply doesn't exist anymore. Um, so these seem to me to be the explan or one of the sets of explanatory variables which tells us why um, now. Seen from Russia's perspective, there is a closing window of opportunity to achieve objectives in Ukraine and in um, modifying the wider European security environment. And from this date on, things just get worse and worse for Russia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jan. Uh... I think uh, the, your, your country is un, uh, uh, facing uh, the great challenge, uh, definitely, uh, because all, all unintegrated territory can face from Russia direct military threat and hybrid threat in combination. I think maybe Sweden shall think twice uh, because it is out of umbrella. Uh, anyhow, next on our list, and first of all, thank you again, Jan, you were very active and thank you so much uh, to supporting uh, and participating to almost all our webinars. Uh, next on our list is one of the founding members of our institute, Colonel Shal Shai. Colonel Shai, the uh, floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Darko. Uh, first of all, I would like to relate to the definition of uh, the current situation. And some experts claim that we are living in uh, a new era of Cold War. I think that it can be better uh, described as a new a great game. And uh, actually, um, 
It's about the world order and uh, the world order uh, after the Cold War was designed by uh, America and the West. And in the current uh, great uh, game, Russia and China are challenging the Pax Americana world order. This is in general terms. The current play yard is Ukraine, but we have to look at it from a more extended uh, point of view. And when we look at the goals of uh, President Putin to make Russia great again, uh, it's one uh, significant part is about the sphere of influence. So the sphere of influence in the former part of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, of course, is in first priority, but the Middle East is a part of this game uh, as well. And I would like to relate in the few minutes that I have to several uh, theaters in the Middle East and how they will be affected by the current crisis. And in the future, we don't know what will be the end of this crisis, but for sure they will be affected significantly uh, from these uh, results. So first of all, I would like to relate to one of the more uh, problematic players in the region, and it's Turkey. Turkey from uh, 2014 onwards, it, at least officially, uh, took the side of uh, Ukraine in the debate following the annexation of Crimea and uh, voiced support to the Ukrainians' uh, territorial uh, integrity. But the problem of uh, Turkey uh, is that on one hand, it's a member of uh, NATO with all the responsibilities that are part of it. On the other hand, they have to find a way how to balance it uh, with their interests with Russia that uh, opposing almost in all the theaters in the Middle East. I mean, regarding the conflict in Syria, uh, Russia saved Assad. Uh, Turkey was one of the uh, enemies of Assad along all the way till today. Uh, if we look at uh, Libya, uh, Russia is supporting uh, General Haftar. I will relate to it a little bit later. Uh, Turkey is supporting the GNA, the government. Uh, so Turkey is in a very sensitive position and the best example to show uh, this dilemma is the Turkish decision to uh, purchase uh, the S-400 uh, air defense system from uh, Russia uh, against uh, the US and uh, NATO, and so far they pay a significant uh, political and economical uh, price for this uh, decision. So, Turkey regarding the current uh, crisis is in a very sensitive position. Uh, last year, they sold uh, Ukraine uh, drones. Uh, the Ukrainian forces used these drones already in uh, Donbas against uh, pro-Soviet forces. So in any military uh, conflict in the future, uh, Turkey will be in a very sensitive position. Uh, position, uh, how to react to the situation. And I think that uh, the way that this crisis uh, will uh, end uh, will have a significant uh, influence on the Turkish uh, position and policy in the future. And uh, when we uh, look to the next uh, country, uh, Syria, Syria is the best example uh, to understand the uh, Russian uh, strategy regarding areas of uh, influence. Syria was part of the Soviet uh, Union's uh, area of uh, interest and influence in the Middle East. 
and uh, Russia used the uh, civil war in uh, Syria and uh, made the most significant uh, military intervention so far uh, beyond the post-Soviet uh, uh, sphere. So on one hand, uh, Russia saved the Assad uh, regime and actually uh, Soviet forces uh, paved the way for Assad to remain in power. But the Russians are uh, in Syria to stay. And in spite of several declarations that uh, Russia will withdraw the forces from uh, Syria, it didn't happen. And actually, uh, Russia signed a long-term agreement with uh, Syria for uh, air base in Hamaim and uh, naval base in Tartus. And these are the main bases of uh, regular uh, Russian forces um, in the region. So the Russian will remain in Syria and Syria is a platform to send messages uh, to the rest of the region and beyond. Uh, I will give you just an example. Uh, in uh, September was a meeting between uh, Assad and uh, Putin in uh, Moscow. Uh, they discussed the cooperation between their military forces. One of the uh, concerning uh, developments we saw it last week when a uh, first time uh, Syrian and Russian airplanes made uh, joint military patrols, including along the Golan Heights border. So we have to take in consideration that the crisis in uh, Ukraine can be translated to certain uh, steps and uh, messages beyond, I mean, in the Middle Eastern uh, theater. The third area or theater that I would like to mention is Libya. As I said before, uh, again, Russia used the civil war in, uh, in Libya to take a side in this conflict. Uh, the side that they chose to support was of General uh, Haftar, who controls the eastern part of uh, Libya. And uh, uh, Russian uh, mercenaries, uh, uh, mainly from the Wagner group, but also mercenaries that they uh, mobilized from uh, Syria, are a significant uh, force in uh, Libya. We have to take in consideration that uh, Russia can be a stabilizer in the region. I mean, they can support the peace process in Libya and they can be a destabilizing force as well if this will uh, support the Russian interests. The last point that I would like to mention is Iran. In Syria, Iran and Russia operated together against the ISIS and the other enemies of uh, Assad. And now they share uh, the fruits of the, of the victory with a certain kind of competition between the two sides. Uh, we have to take in consideration that Russia is a significant uh, part to any nuclear deal with uh, Iran. And again, Russia can contribute to achieve an agreement, and Russia can support the Iranian side to foil this attempt and to destabilize the, the region. So to conclude my part and uh, to end within the time frame, uh, we have to see how this crisis in uh, Ukraine will end. Uh, and. Uh, we have to take in consideration that like in 2014-2015, Russia is playing on the whole uh, chess play. And uh, the maneuvers 
are not limited to Ukraine, and we have to take it in consideration, uh, especially in uh, the Middle Eastern uh, theater that can be affected, as I said, to both direction as a stabilizer or a destabilizing uh, power. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shaul, uh, so much. Uh, I, I hope uh, that Gordon is with us. I see him. Gordon, uh, can you hear us? Yes, I can. I hope that you can hear me also. Uh, good. Yeah. I just received the message that you have a problem with the microphone. Yes, but I, I removed the microphones and earphones so I can speak. I'm using the uh, computer. Okay, the floor, the garden floor is yours. And before everything, I would like to thank, uh, thank you especially because you uh, give us a chance and allowed us to use your WebEx uh, from Zagreb Security Forum. And uh, of course, to be co-organizer of this important conference. And I thank you and your colleagues from uh, Zagreb Security Forum and Institute for the Hybrid uh, warfare. So, uh, Gordon, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. I hope that uh, this computer, Vulgaris, is going to work now, despite the fact that it's a new one. And what Jan Anthony said, uh, he, I'm using also applications, so I don't know how trustful are they, but we are using this Cisco WebEx because we are using this uh, application within the NATO, and I think it's much better than use it with Zoom. Uh, thank you very much, and it's nice to see you again here. And Darko, your ideas and your suggestions proves to be really on time and that we found ourselves every time in the middle of the crisis that we are discussing about it. And just like the last times, I think that uh, personally, I'm going to learn something and I'm going to try to implement it in future. Uh, what my previous esteemed colleague said, and especially what Shlomo said, indeed, that we have time with that we are dealing with very important topics that are occupying public sphere and present significant threat to international peace and stability. And that is uh, why our expertise, I think, is very important in order to offer solutions how the crisis can be escalated and that the stability can be returned in a way that it, it needs to be function. One of the first points that I'm also using here in the equation of public sphere is that Russia has the right to seek and resist on the protection of its own national interests, both in Russia and abroad. This is a conditio sine qua non of all of those activities and procedures and processes that needs to be done in the future. But also Ukraine as a sovereign state has the right to make sovereign decisions about its destiny. It's about its future, about their decisions, about the peaceful reintegration of the occupied territories about the directions of its further development, especially in the framework of new international relations in new international circumstances. Of course, given that sovereignty comes from the people that are representing that their free will, that we hope that free will on the elections are referendums are free, Ukraine must decide about it, its own strategic decisions, about the strategic direction of us, us that they are going to use in the future, where they would like to go, with whom, how, with which speed. What is important is that we have to learn from negative experiences from the recent past about the hybrid threats and their malicious influences to different elections and referendums. Therefore, Ukraine, with its reliable partners and friends, needs to make strong efforts to protect the integrity of these processes, elections and referendums, in all of the three domains, in the political, information and administrative domain of, of these elections. Also, those two attitudes, Russian national interest and Ukraine sovereignty, are strongly opposed to each other and are publicly announced cause of the current crisis, but also for the future crisis in the eastern flank of the Europe. Ukraine is not Georgia or Kazakhstan, so Russia cannot count on a quick takeover of control and application of its power against the Ukraine. On the other hand, Ukraine, what is very important, has to fulfill the international obligations signed by the Minsk II agreement, no matter how painful they seem at the moment for the Ukraine. In this way, the situation can be stabilized, military political tensions will be calmed down to an acceptable, let's say acceptable under quotations, level and area will be given to the development of Ukrainian institutions that could gradually lead to stronger and full integration of the occupied territories in the Ukrainian constitutional order. We should be have in mind that there are still some differences between the status of the occupied eastern parts of Ukraine and occupied Crimea. The process around Crimea will be much more difficult, 
demanding and long term and then the eastern occupied territories of Ukraine. Also, Ukraine, what is very ending, must refrain from all offensive activities, especially not to respond to provocations that could occur from the uh, uh, occupied territories. Ukraine needs to work together with partners and allies on building democratic institutions, developing democracy, encouraging investment and the economy, building its own defense capabilities to a higher level than it is now, to protect its information space from malicious influences that will certainly continue to introduce and disseminate quite a lot of different disinformations in order to further destabilize and divide Ukrainian society and the state and bring pro-Russian politicians in power like we saw it in the near, in near past. What is important is that the NATO and EU must continue to support these processes in Ukraine and be a guarantor of its sovereignty and independence while maintaining its inter internal unity. On the other hand, what is very important for us, for example, in for Croatia, and you can see it here uh, in these uh, uh, webinars and our uh, meetings, despite the fact that 25 or uh, 28 years ago, Darko and I, we were on opposing side during the Croatian's war of independence. Now, in the last 10, 12 years, we are sitting together, working together, and we are making quite a lot of good things together, despite the fact that I said 20 years or 30 years ago, we were enemies we were in the combat units on all of our sides and this has to be done in the future because there is a peace is a stable time peace is a more traditional time and peace is the uh, normal situation then better it's a, and it's a better than war every uh, confront every confrontation is can cause much more damages than any kind of peace so there is no price that needs to be paid in order to have a peaceful solutions that's the, one of the reasons what Croatia as a, as a partner of the international community with its experience in the peaceful reintegration of the Croatian Danube region during the 90s can provide to the Ukraine and to help them how to define it uh, and to share our experiences peaceful resolution of such crises and the process that needs to be done as a long-term process to reintegrate occupied the territories. And if we are going to start this process, for example, during this year, somewhere in the mid this year or the end, in 2025, 2026, there should be enough positive results in order to integrate fully in, uh, the occupied territories, Donbass and Lugansk, Lugansk in, in the Ukrainian territory. I said Crimea is something, it's a little bit different thing, but also it needs to be a process and that needs to be very uh, patience it requires very much patience from the Ukraine, much wisdom and development of uh, and lots of sacrifices. I don't need to forget this word. Sacrifices is something that needs to be taken in considerations. And this is a multi-dimensional multi process that needs time and it needs a will and it needs a statement that are going to run those processes on both of levels. So for the beginning, I think that I'm going to to, to finish my uh, presentation. If somebody would like to uh, to comment and to, to ask something, please do not hesitate to do it. Darko? Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we are learning more and more from uh, every next speaker. Um, uh, next on our list is uh, Professor Swaran Singh. And I must admit uh, that Professor is very present in Indian, uh, not only in Indian, but in Asia. Uh, all webinars, conference, uh, and uh, I am really, I admire Professor Singh for his energy. So, Professor Singh, uh, uh, floor, uh, floor is yours, sir. Uh, Dr. Darko Trifonovic, uh, I also wish to compliment uh, the INS team for organizing such a brilliant uh, discussion involving uh, experts uh, from across the world. I hope uh, my visual and audio is uh, reaching all of you fine. Uh, I will use my 10 minutes to uh, clearly, first of all, put in front of you what I see is happening in, in the Ukrainian crisis situation, uh, and then share with you why I think that represents uh, the lingering uh, legacies of Cold War years. And then I will finally close by sharing with you how does India see these crises evolving and uh, why should India be concerned with the crisis evolving the, the way they are evolving. 
Uh, first of all, all of us are familiar that in last 30 years, uh, in 1990, there was a huge debate as to after end of Cold War, uh, do we actually need NATO? And NATO has uh, since been struggling to constantly establish its uh, credentials. Uh, and in doing so, it has expanded now. It has about 30 members. Uh, we understand that three of the former Soviet republics, the Baltic states, have joined it, and other four East European uh, Eastern Bloc states have joined it. So in 30 years, NATO had, uh, in, in, in some sense, continued its uh, contestations and confrontation with the former Soviet Union, uh, at least subconsciously expanding to capture more and more territories. And with Ukraine virtually reaching Russian borders, Russian land borders, uh, uh, very clearly. Uh, so NATO has made uh, enormous uh, strides in that sense, representing continuity of what was happening during the Cold War years. Uh, what is happening today, and I was happy to see you know, Professor Shapiro, I think, gave example of uh, General Winter, and he talked of Napoleon's uh, invasion and, of course, German invasion and others. To me, unlike how Dr. Ian Anthony concluded by saying that increasingly perhaps uh, uh, Putin seems to be standing at disadvantage, I wish to argue exactly the opposite. Uh, he himself said that according to the constitutional amendments, uh, Putin is likely to stay on as president for life. Uh, there is no other world leader which has uh, that kind of past experience of running a, running a country for 20 years and uh, being hopeful to continue forever. First of all, nobody is expecting President Joe Biden to contest next elections. Uh, you have a new uh, national leader in uh, Germany. Uh, in Britain, uh, Johnson, uh, Boris Johnson is constantly struggling with his domestic uh, uh, situation. Uh, maybe France to some extent is uh, um, you know, able to uh, say things independently. But all of you remember, Putin has enormously cultivated these European leaders, and that is why you see NATO today is a clearly divided house. Other than Baltic states, which can only speak with zero capabilities, Britain to some extent, which sees global status in singing the master's voice for United States, little bit Canada, but again, not much able to do, NATO stands clearly divided house. At best, it is talking of what it says, unbearable, severe sanctions. Now, Putin is used to sanctions for the last, last 20 years. In fact, let me argue, Putin has enormous, uh, uh, not just experience, but immunity, Im impunity today. His uh, role, at least alleged role in 2016-2020 presidential elections in the United States has led to nothing. Look at the way he has dealt with Alexei Navalny at home. Remember last year, thousands of people in protests inside Russia. Nothing breaks his rule. Nothing breaks his control. Now you see he's uh, able to hold nine national leaders of uh, uh, CSTO, Collective St Security Treaty Organization. There. He had a summit recently. He recently had a summit meeting with Xi Jinping, with Indian Prime Minister. Iranian President has just visited him. So Putin to me seems to be in far more advantageous position today, despite being pushed to the wall. And if you remember Crimea, he's not going to invade uh, uh, Ukraine that will justify liberal democracies to take a military action. Remember Crimea. And imagine what he can do in Donbas. In uh, Donetsk and Dohansk People's Republics, the so-called People's Republics. Clearly, Putin today stands to have enormous advantage, but again, the obsession with territoriality, territory you know, to be captured. In fact, there were reports at some time that Putin was imagining that Belarus and, and uh, Ukraine could be merged with Russia. And look at the way he supplied CSTO, Russian forces mostly for uh, uh, Lushenko last year and more recently to President Tokayev. He's able to showcase his uh, uh, red runs around that region very clearly. And you notice that Ukraine President Zelensky understands this, and that is how he's not willing. He's telling Americans, he's telling British, your estimates are overestimated, you're overreacting. 
because he understands where the situation could end up. You know, Britain recently is saying that uh, Russia is even planning to put up another politician to to take over uh, from Zelensky in uh, in Ukraine. So uh, Ukraine understands those limitations. So fundamentally, what I'm underlining here is obsession with continuing with what was Cold War, and most powers are comfortable with that kind of game. Definitely, military industrial complex, armed forces, NATO, they have they are the constituencies that are pushing everybody to focus on those issues and continue with those contestations and completely ignore what are real issues facing the world. You know, Joe Biden recently spoke of tundra burning. Climate change is the real issue. You know, Istanbul is having snow. Snow is happening in, in regions which never have seen snow before. Terrorism is another challenge. You know, whether it is the Houthis in in uh, in, uh, in in Sudan or in, uh, sorry, in uh, you know, look at any or, you know, what is happening in Afghanistan? What is happening in Syria? Who is supplying these weapons to everybody? So military industrial complex is continuing to supply weapons around the world and no terrorists are ever seen in dirge of weapons. Who is selling the weapons around the world uh, in terms of highest percentage? We understand it is United States. And so we are not focusing on issues that need to be focused, which is terrorism, climate change, pandemic, health, development. And I think here is obsession to go back to Europe. And now how does India seize it? India sees it very clearly, possibility of US friends and allies and Russia now contesting in Europe, ignoring Indo-Pacific completely, ignoring what is happening in Afghanistan completely. And now if that happens, not only Russia will get further closer to China, China will get a free hand to do what it wants to do in Indo-Pacific. It will get a free hand to do what it wants to do with all its neighbors, whether it is Japan, Taiwan, Vietnam, and India. India, China have been seeing certain tensions for the last two years. And if United States is going to focus along with its friends and allies in Ukraine and Europe, obviously Chinese will have a great free hand to do what they want to do. Of course, it will also mean enormous volatility in international market, particularly in energy sector. And India is the, one of the largest importers of energy in that sense. So, you know, any one dollar uh, oil or gas prices going up have a clear impact on what, what it uh, means for India. India also is directly impacted if uh, we are not looking at focusing on Afghanistan and the chaos in Afghanistan and the surreptitious uh, departure of American forces, which is partly why they are looking at another crisis because A, they are now free, they have armed forces that, that need certain job to be done. And they need to, you know, sort of beat their breasts in showcasing some other uh, theater where they are showcasing their military power. But in the meanwhile, humanitarian catastrophe in Afghanistan would lead to chaos. And that will have refugees, radicalization, terrorists, all kinds of troubles uh, for neighboring countries, including India. And finally, let me mention this ratcheting of, of tensions between Russia and the uh, United States and its friends and allies on one side, Russian Russia and uh, uh, its own friends and allies on other is going to push India to choose sides. In fact, there are voices in the United States that are already indicating that India should clear as to which side it stands on this uh, uh, crisis in Ukraine. And India doesn't want to take sides. India has had a policy of non-alignment and after collapse of Soviet Union end of Cold War, we call it from non-alignment to multi-alignment. So India believes in aligning and partnering with as many countries in as many sectors as possible. Middle East is a good example. India today is friendly to Palestine, to Israel, to UAE, to Iran, to Saudi Arabia and everyone. So now this crisis continuing is also going to create a direct pressure on India to be forced to take sides. And India is not willing to take sides, uh, is, is not comfortable in taking sides. So in that sense, continuing of this ratcheting up of the crisis, which very often most people believe it's not going to lead to any conventional war because neither side wants a conventional war here yeah, could at best lead to internal chaos and resurgence and terrorism and violence inside Ukraine, which is not good for Ukraine. That is where it is going to be. 
and of course everyone knows that uh, putin has given conditions that uh, america is not willing or is not in position to accept that ukraine will never be part of nato that all the nato deployments and forces will be taken out from former uh, eastern bloc countries or former soviet uh, republics it's a it's a bargaining thing he's doing but i assume that the fact that he has continuously deployed 100000 troops on the border for so many months and nothing has happened now, is a reflection of uh, Putin today being in a stronger position to bargain with uh, Joe Biden. And Joe Biden increasingly is under stress, whether it is his popularity ratings at home or his uh, foreign policy disasters one after, one after another. He's yet to come out of shadow of Donald Trump. So to me, unlike uh, uh, my other panelists, uh, the, the, you know, Ian Anthony was mentioning it is increasingly going to be disadvantaged Putin. I think it's going to be increasingly advantaged Putin. Because Putin and Lavrov have stayed there in position for 20 years, they're likely to continue as he himself said. So I think it will require, as some voices in US are beginning to talk to open negotiations, diplomatic negotiations, offer, you know, shifting of missile deployments, of arms control, of CBMs and things like that. That is a more sensible way of addressing the crisis. And military is not a solution. Military is uh, obsession with military is a reflection of seeking refuge in what these countries have learned to do rather than facing new challenges which they face today. Thank you and back to the Darko. Thank you, Professor Svanen. Uh, uh, next on our list is uh, Professor Jonathan Levy. Uh, Jonathan, are you with us? Yes, you are. Sir, floor is yours. Just unmute your microphone. Uh, you need to unmute the microphone, John. Uh, mic microphone, John. Okay. Here I am. Thank you, Darko. Um, being a lawyer, I want to talk about the uh, legal aspect of the Russia-Ukraine crisis. And uh, we know all territorial disputes have legal components. And some territorial disputes, maybe... The bulk of them are settled amicably through the Permanent Court of Arbitration, International Court of Justice, uh, the United Nations, or some other regional international governmental organization. However, the Ukraine-Russia territorial disputes are protracted and have led to armed conflict and civilian casualties and clearly are not going to be uh, amicably settled in the near future. Uh, we have... Uh, Two aspects to the territorial dispute, uh, Crim or Crimea and Donetsk, Lugansk. Uh, they're both different issues legally. Um, the Crimea situation is relatively straightforward legally, and it's so far fairly nonviolent. Um, Crimea was previously part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic uh, prior to 1991 when Ukraine became independent. And well, we hear a lot about uh, its status before 1954 when Crimea was historically always part of Russia and became Ukrainian in 1954. I think that's legally irrelevant because if we start examining all the different boundary issues related to the Soviet Union, we would not only be looking at all the internal borders of Russia, the borders of the 15 re former republics, but also Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, Finland, Poland, all their borders were set by the Soviet Union or with input by the Soviet Union. So really the only important thing here is what is the post 1991 status of Crimea? What is legally relevant there? And is it even open to interpretation? One thing that is often overlooked is that when Ukraine became independent in 1991, or as the Ukrainians would say, their independence continued in 1991, Crimea attempted to secede immediately from Ukraine and actually maintained a de facto republic, uh, secessionary republic, until 1993, at which point a three-party solution was reached. Uh, the Crimeans, the Russians, and the Ukrainians reached an agreement because Russia was also still present in the Crimea with their naval bases. And 
At that point, the, an agreement was reached. Uh, a a uh, Crimean Autonomous Republic would be established. Uh, Ukraine would get uh, Crimea, but with an autonomous U Crimean Republic. And Russia would retain naval base leases in Crimea. In 1996, the Ukrainian government unilaterally declared Crimea constitutionally autonomous, but inseparable from Ukraine. However, at all times, Crimea remained steadfastly pro-Russian politically and routinely elected pro-Russian politicians both locally and to the Verkhovna Rada. Um, in fact, uh, they would usually elect the most far-right pro-Russian politicians possible, uh, mainly from the uh, Communist Party of Ukraine, for example. So um, Crimea always, always maintained a pro-independent stance, uh, a pro-Russian stance, even during the time it was part of Ukraine. When the democratically elected Yanukovych government fell in 2014, we have to remember Yanukovych was democratically elected president of Ukraine. And a, tradition, a transitional government or regime was installed without a vote initially. Crimea, with Russian support, invoked its autonomous status and removed itself from Ukraine. Now, Ukraine obviously disputes the legality of that unilateral secession and the subsequent referendum held under Russian auspices. And the UN and most of its members also take the uh, Ukrainian position, although there are a minority of members of the UN that adopt the uh, Russian position that you that cream is ours, cream nas, it's uh, part of uh, Russia. Um, and it is true that given the demographics of Crimea, that any referendum held there under any circumstances would no doubt yield a majority of voters voting to join Russia or secede from Ukraine. Uh, Russia's also made very substantial economic and infrastructure investments in Crimea, including the Kerch Bridge. So uh, I would say if, if even if there was a uh, new uh, plebiscite or referendum held in Crimea, under it doesn't matter whose auspices, it's pretty clear the vote would go toward Russia. Uh, the legal question, though, is what were the rights of the Autonomous Republic of Ukraine? What are the rights of an autonomous republic when a federal government falls or the parent government falls and a lapse, a transition occurs? The Ukrainian government fell. Yanukovych left the country and a transitional government came in and no matter how brief that was, that provided the autonomous government, uh, which had proceeded uninterrupted, to become fully independent. And while there's no obvious legal precedent, Ukraine's inability to maintain civil control in Crimea during this period, assuming Ukraine exercised uh, much power there to begin with, is also part of the blame. So. What, how, do we, how do we look at this legal issue of autonomy? What does it mean under the legal system? Well, like with many things under the law, it's all how you define the word autonomous. So we have maybe three different ways of looking at that. Under the French and Dutch colonial systems, an autonomous entity is a proto-independent self-governing authority. That is a former colony that's in the um, uh, transition to uh, independence. Another way autonomous can be used is a de facto internally independent entity whose existence is guaranteed by some bilateral or multilateral agreement. Good example is Kosovo from the standpoint of Serbia and those countries that have not recognized Kosovo. Kosovo from the standpoint of Serbia is an autonomous republic with uh, elements of de facto independence due to third party intervention. So if you looked at Crimea, also you had three parties there, the Crimeans, the Russians, and the Ukrainians. So perhaps Kosovo falls under that rubric. Another potential is a Soviet-type autonomous republic, but a Soviet-type autonomous republic was really a subunit of one of the former 15 republics of the Soviet Union and really just had some internal control. And because the Crimean Autonomous Republic was set up after 1991, after the fall of the Soviet Union, I don't think that model works. 
But no matter how you look at it, the Crimean Autonomous Republic is sui generis, or in a class by itself, because it was set up after 1991, and it had already attempted to secede from the newly independent Ukraine. And Russia was a necessary partner to the establishment of the Autonomous Republic, owing to the continued presence of Russia at the naval bases in Crimea. So, whether the fall of the Yanukovych government and the circumstances surrounding it freed Crimea from being tethered to Ukraine, that's a question that could be answered by an independent tribunal, although the people of Crimea have already spoken. But perhaps, rather than resubmit the issue uh, to another vote where the outcome is probably foreordained in, you know, in favor of Russia, the legal issue could be looked at quite properly by one of the many international tribunals to handle these matters. Um, the issue of Donetsk, Lugansk is much simpler. It, it's a simple issue under international law. Unquestionably, Donetsk and Lugansk are territories of Ukraine which seceded by force of arms. They uh, seceded and they seceded uh, by use of uh, military. Um, the former leader of Donetsk, Alexander Zakharchenko, who was assassinated in 2018, had an ambition to form an even larger state called Nova Russia, and, and that would have had to have been formed, of course, via aggression, but this did not come to pass. Um, we also have the uh, Minsk Accords, which we've talked about, which are a seemingly reasonable, but as with many of these things, completely unworkable agreement that would have returned Donetsk and Lugansk to Ukraine under self-government, but it's not going to work. And, and the legacy of the failure of the Minsk Accords is the Donbass Front and the continuing state of perpetual war, a low, low what we'd call a low uh, conflict over there, uh, but continuingly people killed every day and civilian casualties. Uh, therefore, I, I think it remains to Russia to use the ultimate legal solution. And that is a solution that, that should be of interest to many of you. It is the just the just war precedent, J-U-S-T, just war. And who used that precedent to end the endless conflicts in former Yugoslavia? NATO. N NATO declared war on Yugoslavia on the pretext of preempting conflict in Kosovo. Under the just war scenario that's been legalized by NATO and the UN, Russia could use limited force to once and for all detach Donetsk and Lugansk from Ukraine under the uh, um, position that they were stopping the Ukrainian inclination to use military force against civilian targets in Donetsk and Lugansk. And uh, that's the precedent was set in Yugoslavia. Now, whether Russia would go as far as replicating NATO's 30-day bombing campaign in Serbia is unclear, but some use of military force would undoubtedly be necessary and undoubtedly there'd be a belated NATO response of some sort under the guise of peacekeeping that would manifest and probably something similar to the Russian operation in Pristina in 1999 where a small Russian force of paratroopers more or less halted NATO's momentum toward Belgrade. So one thing for sure, Russia feels entitled to forcefully bring about peace on its borders to end the unending Ukrainian war. And this is very simple, sim, uh, similar to what NATO did when it lost uh, patience with the uh, unending conflict in Yugoslavia. So, and it's, and it's a um, situation that is discussed in Russia that what's good for NATO is also good for Russia. And I think if we looked at it from the standpoint of uh, legalities, maybe so. Uh, thank you uh, for your time. Thank you, Vivi. Uh, now, ne next on our list is Professor Rastislav Kazansky. Professor Kazansky, floor is yours. Rastislav, are you with us? Do we have Rastislav? Oh, yes, yeah. you are with us. So. Yes, I'm here. Good, good, to, good uh, to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> so, floor is yours. Good afternoon. From Slovakia. I hope, I hope you are not under the snow as well. So, no, no, <laughs> I'm here. A little bit problem with this connection <laughs> to put my name inside, but I'm here. That's the important way. So, 
thank you thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity to see you again and uh, to speak uh, to say something uh, to the uh, uh, honorable uh, colleagues and professors i was uh, carefully listening uh, my uh, call speakers and I would like uh, to be a little bit more, a little bit theoretical, but uh, I think that uh, all of you agree that uh, in the connection of the uh, this uh, conflict uh, uh, in the Ukraine and the uh, very uh, hard situation is uh, connected with the uh, geopolitical aspects. Uh, this geopolitical point of view is uh, mostly oh i'm sorry camera uh this uh, geopolitical let's say uh, kind of speech is uh, traditionally used in a, a, a russian and pro russian communication because uh, today it's uh, very present that uh, uh, the russian representatives use uh, the traditional geopolitical theories and thinking as an argument for the practical political steps. And I think that's uh, very important to uh, put impact uh, to the uh, roots and the uh, results uh, where these ideas is coming from. Uh, the geopolitical aspect is uh, closely connected to the, let's say, the school uh, of political realism. Uh, the Putin administrative is presenting their own steps uh, and uh, pressure uh, as a result of uh, uh, political realism, which has a, a strictly uh, practically um, issues. Uh, this idea of uh, the political uh, realism is uh, something like a opposite to the principles uh, which are represented of the liberal theories which are based on a uh, uh, respect of the international law for example the state uh, sovereignty the basic idea uh, what is the background of the uh, putin's policy is uh, uh, used uh, ideology uh, it's ideology connected with uh, euro Asianism, uh, like a political movement in Russia, uh, what is based that uh, and or assumes uh, that uh, the Russian civilization does not belong to the European or Asian category, but uh, has a specific uh, Eurasian aspect. Uh, this movement uh, is closely connected with the uh, Bolshevik re uh, revolution, the tradition, political tradition with the uh, uh soviet union as a uh, stepping stone on the way to creating a new national identity that would reflect the unique nature of the russia's geopolitical position so uh, uh the movement uh, so the movement uh uh is um, um, no, um argued and uh the uh, minor revival began after the fall of the Soviet Union in the uh, beginning of the 25th uh, uh, century. The euro asianists criticized uh, the um, disruption of uh, the Soviet Union uh, and uh, is focusing and uh, looking back to the political traditions. Uh, the tradition of uh, the forming the euro uh geopolitical thinking is closely connected with some names like Trubetskoy, Savitsky, Puczynski, Mirsky, uh, uh, and today uh, the very uh, well-known two authors, uh, Dugin and uh, Starikov. These books are uh, very, let's say, presented as a popular uh, in a uh, public and uh, expert level. I think that it's uh, very important to study that because when we are studying uh, the Russian principles of new euro, new euro Arjanism, we can understood and uh, better understood uh, the, the political, the practical political steps. Uh, so, um, one of the guiding principles of this geopolitical ideology is the idea of the greater Russia. So, 
we should uh, take pay attention for this fact. Uh, this is this concept concept was uh, in the past uh, applied to the territories of the Moscow Principality and later to Russia. Uh, uh, this term is uh, used from the medieval age and uh, it's not uh, connected not only with the ethnic Russians, but uh, mm, the ethnogenesis of this term is uh, connected with the principle of uh, great, uh, great Russia. Um, so one of the leading personalities of contemporary uh, Euro Asianism is undoubtedly Alexander Dugin. This philosopher, what is present like a philosopher, political analyst and strategist, uh, was the main organizer of the National Bolshevik Party, the National Bolshevik Front and Euro Asia Party. But he was working and is working as an uh, advisor to the State Duma speaker, former State uh, Dynasty speaker, Gennady Seleznyov, and uh, the important person in a Russian policy, Sergei Narishkin, as a leading member of the uh, ruling uh, United Russia Party. Uh, he was uh, he was right uh, around the three, uh, 30 books. So uh, the most important are the fundamentals of geopolitics and the fourth political theory. <clears throat> what is the uh, construction, the theory which is coming into the practice? Um, uh, the form backward is uh, of his theory is uh, also the Anglo-Saxon principles, the old form of theories like. Mackinder or Spikerman, which it proposes a conflict uh, like a um, graph of uh, uh, the conflict between two fundamentally antagonistic blocks. Uh, so this uh, connotation and this confrontation is the base of uh, the concept of the uh, construction of the world conflict. So uh, in uh, one side is the Euro Asia and another side is a something like a uh, sea power or an Atlantic power, which are represented with the contemporary, let's say, like the enemies like NATO, uh, like the European Union, and so on. So these principles, like neuro Asianism, is a um, theory which can, uh, which is very attractive for the intellectuals, politicians because uh, it offers very uh, simple, very easy understanding uh, of the collapse of the Soviet Union and restoring and the restoration of the Rus Russians' troubled historical and political uh, continuity. Uh, this ideology, Euro-Asianism, is, uh, is explaining the success, the diversity, uh, and breadth of discoveries. It's a political doctrine in a strict sense, the theory of nation, the ethnos and outer globalist philosophy of history uh, as a new pragmatic formulation of Sovietism and substitute for the global explanatory schemes of, like before was the Marxism uh, or uh, another, mm, let's say, Soviet uh, historical principles. So, uh, the euro asianism is often claimed as a, a science who messages about Russia does not depend on a personal consideration, but it's a methodological and objective analysis of the Russian interests. It draws much of its successes, of its commitment to creating uh, something like a new academic discipline, such as geop geopolitics, cultural studies, conflict studies, ethnopsychology, and others. But um, uh, the Euro-Asian principles is coming in a practice. Uh, at the second part, I wouldn't like to speak so much, uh, I need to be short and uh, my speech, but what is the role and uh, uh, the position of, of the Ukraine in uh, and its importance of in the Euro-Asian strategy? Uh, Dugin's inner empire, like a creation uh, of the, let's say, future greater Russia includes Ukraine, of course, as a something like the foundations of geopolitics, 
where uh, he writes that Ukraine should be annexed by Russia because I seeking I, I, I try to cite it, these words, Ukraine as a state has no geopolitical significance, no special cultural import or universal significance, no ge geographical uniqueness, no um, ethnic exclusiveness, its particular territorial ambitions pose a huge danger to all of Euro-Asia and it's without a solution to the Ukrainian problem. There is no point in talking about continental politics in general. Uh, the Ukraine should not be allowed to remain independent unless it's a cordon sanitaire, which would be unacceptable. This is cited from the Dugin's uh, work, uh, The um, uh, Fundamentals of Geopolitics, uh, written in 1997 year. So this theory, this background, theoretical background is very uh, let's say very old, uh, it's, it's something like a paradigm of the uh, security and uh, the foreign policy of Russia into the Ukraine. So the um, um, we should uh, mention that um, um, uh, that uh, well, my remarks um, uh, the Russia, since uh, 2013, uh, from the Euro Maidan, uh, Euro Maidan, like they uh, proclaiming this uh, uh, this political changes in uh, Kiev and Ukraine, and uh, um, supporting the um, uh, separatist uh, territories like uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, and then uh, the let's say the humanitarian or a uh, silent support of this uh, regime and uh, the occupation of the uh, Crimea uh, Peninsula was the um, practical uh, steps uh, which uh, means the um, um, leading uh, the uh, practical policy uh, signed uh, in uh, this uh, political ideas. But uh, let's go. Let's go. So Russia, Russia is not using. Rasko, oh, sorry. Please come to the conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is what we know as a hard power, but uh, the uh, not only today contemporary discussed uh, hard power is a present. Uh, the Russia is using also the combination of uh, the hard power and soft powers, like a smart power. Uh, especially the uh, energy, the energy policy, and uh, we can speak more about the economic uh, issues, uh, not only the Nord Stream, but uh, also uh, another aspects uh, uh, of uh, the pressure. So the conclusion: uh, the conflict of the Ukraine is uh, one of the uh, used examples of the geopolitical thinking. Uh, so uh, not only Dugin, but also Stariko in his books. And another Eurozionist are referring uh, with the Ukraine as a uh, cordon sanitaire zone, uh, which is uh, traditionally uh, used as a territory of the Euro Asia. So they are promoting this territory like a historically, by law, argued, um, argue, argued territory. One is important thing in this theory, uh, Eurasian. They are not speaking, they are not allowing with the state sovereignty and the borders. In uh, Euro Asian uh, geopolitical thinking, the, the authors, they are not putting any impact to the principles of the law, which means the sovereignty and the respecting the borders. So that's the important. That means these are the roots why the influence of the Russia uh, in the separatic uh, regions are so, uh, uh, so are so strong today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rasto. Thank you. Uh, next on our list, and uh, uh, I think it's very inspirative. I, I tried to actually uh, summarize uh, all, but uh, it is impossible. And I think it will have after last uh, speech of uh, Professor Lasha, Chantu Rije, I hope I pronounce, pronounce this time uh, well, 
Alasha, you can correct me. And I hope I see, I still uh, see that most of you are uh, very awake. Uh, and I hope we will have a little discussion after uh, Professor Alasha uh, presentation. Professor Alasha, floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Darko. I I hope you can uh, hear me well. Um. So my presentation is about um, the language that the two sides, in this case, the Russian Federation and Western allies, specifically the United States are using in expressing their national interest. And this is important, I think, because national, everyone claims to be protecting their own state or national interests. National interests are a common term for the United States. Um, uh, and uh, a state interest is 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 in Russian uh, expressed and uh, used more more frequently. Um, in 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 justifying their own steps in the Ukraine crisis. Um, historically and generally, there have been three ways the states and the state leaders can conceptualize and describe what actually state interests are, what national interests are. Obviously, the concept is abstract, but you have to be able to communicate to others and to your supporters what actually do you mean by uh, an abstract concept. Uh, one more traditional uh, way of uh, expressing and conceptualizing national interest is um, to see your state interest is something that is real. And uh, as, as some of the previous speakers have pointed out, this is a school of realism, real politic. Uh, in this case, a state interests are identified with uh, territorial possessions, with weapons, with um, strategic locations, with the material base resources, uh, the pipelines, the submarines, the law. Um, and this is what the Russian Federation historically has done. And uh, uh, moreover, it has been the case recently, as many of the speakers today have pointed out. Um, there is another way of expressing national interests, and that stresses norms, conventions, uh, rules of behavior, alliances, um, a certain conventions that are acceptable to leading powers in this or or that uh, world order. And this is uh, stressed currently by the United States and, uh, and its allies uh, in the West. So, uh, and that has been the norm um, since the end of the Cold War. Um, so, uh, there is a third option which we won't um, we won't discuss today because it's not relevant uh, to our case. But uh, this uh, juxtaposition of communicating national interests manifests in this particular situation in the two sides speaking past each other. And that, that is a problem. That is a problem because our contemporary world, our modern world is not built uh, by the people or developed by the people who speak past each other. Um, if you were imagined to uh, two engineers speaking and one of them telling the other, listen, I noticed that the bridge um, is crumbling. Something is happening to a bridge. A concrete is falling down. Uh, the other engineer is not likely to dismiss him or her, but instead will propose, okay, let's go and observe. Let's go and measure. Let's find out what the problem is. Um, if, if I were to tell you that I can in 200 meters, you would say, okay, let's test it. Let's experiment. Let's see if it uh, actually works the way you are describing it. Uh, in this way, we find a solution through observation, experimentation, testing is suggesting solutions. This is how the contemporary world that conquered the space created um, many sorts of um, technological marvels, extended human life, fed uh, the starving and eradicated poverty has developed. 
However, if you were to dismiss someone because you just don't accept their point of view and you insist on something you believe is true, is 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 a tribal talk. Is is a talk that is geared towards conflict. It's not gonna resolve anything. It's not gonna uh, suggest any solutions or find any any peaceful outcome. It is geared to conflict and it's gonna produce conflict. It's an old language. It's a language of tribal warfare, and that's what, essentially what we have uh, in the Ukrainian crisis. One side, uh, specifically Moscow, insisting that it's a it's a territorial issues and the geographic issues are paramount to them, while West insists that's an imaginary aspect, norms of behavior, and certain ways of creating. Uh, free and open society, um, certain principles are more important than that. And without finding a common ground, uh, such um, disputes, and this is not new in, uh, in international politics, and um, I'm a professor of diplomacy and diplomatic language, the way things are expressed in international politics are, are, are important. Um, for obvious reasons, because if you don't resolve um, disputes through conversation, through dialogue, through finding common solution, the only other way is, is the language of force. And that's what unfortunately we have here in the case of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Lasha. Uh, actually, thank you all of you for participation. And now it's time for Q&A or question and answer. So if there is any, please uh, uh, just grab the microphone and whoever wants to raise the question, if not now is time. So, Professor from India, please, the floor is yours. I'm uh, Shekhar Adhikari, professor uh, in the Department of Security Studies. So coming to the first uh, speaker, I mean, he raised three important issues. One was the, uh, that was why Ukraine uh, is important today. The, um, to me, why Ukraine is important today for two reasons. One is the American role and the NATO role, hmm, diminishing NATO role and the American role in either uh, in, in Afghanistan. And that led them to play a more dominant role either in Indo-Pacific region or in uh, this particular Ukraine region. Second important point, you uh, he mentioned that the core issue of the crisis, the core issue of the crisis to me is that the Ukraine is divided into Western and North and Eastern Ukraine. The Western is 30% and the other one is 70% which is more dominant by the Russians, uh, you can the social, cultural, and linguistic with this thing. And therefore, they have a better, uh, I mean, hold over the Eastern, uh, over the Northern, over the Northern, this thing, over the Northern Ocean, uh, where they share the border with the European nation. And the third important point, which this mention, the scholar mentioned, limitation of Russian threat. The limitation of Russian threat, I will go back to the history of international relations. If you see that the history of international relations, international politics, what happened when the Cold War was at the peak? When the American and the Russians, what about the Russians and the Americans when the Cold War as at the peak? And then came uh, uh, in the 50s, military and political rapprochement between them, Khrushchev coming with a policy of peaceful coexistence and Kennedy coming with a policy of peaceful competition. Where it did lead, it led to Cuban Missile Crisis. And after that, they agreed for a hotline communication that any crisis in the world will be mean, uh, conveyed to the, uh, uh, to, to the other party. So on that basis, when we talk of Ukraine crisis today, Ukraine crisis, whether 
where they will fight, whether they will have, they will engage, or whether they will military intervention in Ukraine, or the Russian will get hold of this thing. I don't think that the American and the Russian will fight with each other because of the military capability. Still, America, still Russia is a military power to the to the, to the American and they can easily destroy this thing. One more important aspect which I would like to raise is the role of Germany. Germany's role is becoming very important. It is an important pillar of uh, West uh, of NATO. So Germany in today's day is trying to improve the relations with Russians because of the Ukraine. If Russia occupy Ukraine, this means the Rush that the German borders will be vulnerable and they can be uh, in time of crisis, in time of time, this thing, it, can, it could be anything, this thing. And the last point which I would like to mention is that, that we are living after 1991. We are living in an age of not of imperialism, but we are living in an age of development. NATO itself is a, it has become a weak military organization and therefore, and also uh, not so much uh, economic, uh, this thing has coming out from NATO. So NATO has to rethink its political, economic and military strategy to cater the, this, uh, to come out of this crisis, what we have seen in the U Ukraine, this in, in, in Ukraine, Ukraine. So this is this thing. And one other important is the collective security. The role if uh, Russia invade uh, Ukraine, then what will be the role of the uh, collective security? What will be the, whether the provision of collective security will be there, will be there one for all and all for one. Just we saw, we did not saw in the case of the, uh, uh, when, when Iraq uh, invaded Kuwait and there was only 27, 28 countries all over the world that supported this thing. And there was no, that was nothing like a collective security, this thing. So all these points, which I think are important in judging the Ukraine crisis when we talk in terms of this thing. So the Ukraine crisis is, is not about uh, that the actual conflict will take place, but the confrontation will be avoided because the two superpowers or the two great military powers will not involve themselves because we western europe is heavily dependent on america and russia is of course there is there so yeah, this is my we have another another people on the list uh, thank you so much uh, professor shatar uh, we have barack books professor books floor is yours Thank you so much. I would like uh, to ask about brinkmanship. Whether do you think that uh, either Russia or the United States, by their proclamation and acts, are acting on a brinkmanship, which means they know their own restraints, but they broadcast by signals that they're going to either invent or by the United States send troops, which is literally not true. And they're doing that in order to gain more points in the negotiations. Do you think this is the uh, situation and they don't mean business, which means no invasion? So, thank you, Barak. Any more comments or intervention? Oh, Professor Akrab and Shlomo, then follow by Shlomo. I just would like to ask Professor Singh, I hope that he's there, or, or, or Professor Tikari. Uh, we have a here a little bit. Uh, uh, we don't have enough information from the from the India uh, concerning the joint Russian, Iranian, and Chinese navy exercises in North Indian Ocean. Can you give us a little bit more hint about it, if, if you know it, what is going on there and the results of those exercises? Please. Yeah, yeah, I can give you because you. Uh, in 2012, in 2012 when the uh, pro-Russian president was disposed and the new, uh, name, when the, not the pro-Russian, when the, when the Russian, pro-Russian uh, regime was there in Ukraine, 
they established in uh, the Ukraine government established military uh, this thing uh, relationship with India and also and they signed some naval agreement with India naval agreement with India which India does not want to lose so therefore India does not want to have a better relation with both the countries with either with Russia or with Ukraine so it, it is in a it, it, uh, trying to balance both the countries and India has uh, if you see in international politics in today's world and what India's contribution is as sort of a balancer balancing America and Russia to my viewpoint balancing both the countries we are purchasing weapons from America we are purchasing weapons from Russia so economically we are also dependent on uh, more on NATO on uh, on this European countries uh, rather than uh, military, uh, Russia because Russia being a weak weak uh, economically a weak power so in that sense I can say that and uh, China uh, so for China is concerned China is a bitter enemy India has only two enemies in the world that is Pakistan and uh, China so uh, India has beautifully balanced China also and uh, this happened last year when China claimed the part of uh, Valdi Ostrak that angered um, uh, the, the Russians and the Russian they gave India this S 400 100 missiles to India so this is my observation thank you Professor Shekhar next next on our list is yeah. some uh, Shlomo Spina. thank you thank you Professor Adikawi uh, you're absolutely right of course but I would like to point out that um, Unlike the other um, um, crisis you mentioned, uh, the uh, the missile crisis of uh, 1962, um, the Ukraine crisis yeah. is not an issue of collective defense. There is no question of Article 5 uh, of NATO being invoked here because the Ukraine is not part of uh, NATO. Um, it is not an issue of collective defense, but perhaps of some form of implicit collective defense feeling or, or, or under the surface um sense of we'd better do something for the ukraine there are there is no formality to to this yeah. and that's why the situation is a lot more in a gray area when you are talking about the 1962 missile crisis um or even the only time when nato and its history really enacted article 5 which was after 9 11 a uh, terrorist attack um th there was no gray area it was black and white in terms that an attack happened or was implied planned against the territory of a NATO member state. Um, here it's, it's, it's a lot more, it's a lot weaker in terms of international commitments. And the second point you raised um, was the role of Germany. I would be very cautious in over-evaluating the role of Germany in this crisis. The, the, the Germans do not want this crisis. It was thrust upon them. It is a new government, a new coalition government in, in uh, Germany, um, which comprises three parties, which sometimes finds it difficult to agree even on the day of, of, of the week, uh, let alone on very strong foreign policy. Um, we should remember that the Green Party in Germany now plays a major role. They've traditionally been anti-war, anti-weapons exports, anti-nuclear um, armament, and, and so on. Um, yes, they do find themselves now being forced to accept the idea that maybe armaments can be good at some stages. But we see, um, uh, even in a small way, German rejection of the re-export uh, of, of some small, outdated artillery pieces from, from the former East Germany. Um, I, I mean, the, the, these cannons are not going to play a major role, uh, but it is symbolically. The Germans do not want them to be re-exported to the Ukraine, and they are certainly not, and I wouldn't lose any sleep over it, they are certainly not going to fight uh, Russia over the Ukraine. So let's, yeah. let's get away from any ideas that the Americans or the Germans or anybody else is going to fight with troops on the ground uh, in the Ukraine. This is so far-fetched that I don't see any, uh, any, any way to it. I, I dislike 
quoting British prime ministers. I strongly dislike it because you're usually wrong and they were usually wrong. Uh, you just have to look at the current one and the problems he had at Downing Street during the lockdown. I don't want to get into that. But I think I am quoting or maybe misquoting uh, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, who in 1938, during the Munich crisis about, uh, about Czechoslovakia, said, we are not going to fight over a country we know nothing of, of a people we know little of, something like that. Uh, and, and so let, let's get out of the black and white picture of this conflict. The Americans are not going to, you know, run over with parachuters and, and helicopters to, to Donetsk. Neither are the Russians. Uh, this will most likely remain a diplomatic, uh, 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 maybe even a societal, a, a, an economic conflict. Um, but, and I do hope that I'm not wrong this time, but uh, it seems to me that at least not until the summer, we're not going to see guns shooting. I, I do, however, would like to say one thing uh, and, and to caution. The, the status of the Russian army on the border of Ukraine reminds me now the situation of the Egyptian army in early October 1973 on the Suez Canal border with Israel. Formerly, it was all a training exercise. Hundreds of thousands of Egyptian soldiers, weapons, tanks, everything was ready, but it was a training exercise. And actually, we know today from primary sources, Egypt's decision to attack Israel in the Yom Kippur War was not taken until two or three days before the actual attack. The army was so ready for an attack that it was only a question of go, no-go decision. And, and, and therefore, I, I do caution to look carefully at the situation on the ground. And I am sure Western intelligence services use SIGINT, UMINT, and VISINT uh, sources all the time there to see if there's any, any change in the situation. You, you have a situation in which the Russian forces are there. There is no need for a buildup of forces. They can move from a state of maneuver to a state of invasion within probably 48 hours. Um, so everyone is guess is uh, is open. Um, I certainly can't see the future. I don't think anybody can. It would be interesting yeah. to meet here in several months again to continue discussion on the same topic, and we could view also the developments. Oh well, definitely we we will do. Uh, we will follow the the conflict. And uh, what I'm thinking, uh, if you all agree. Uh, we shall maybe think uh, how to gather all, let's say, recommendation out of this uh, uh, international uh, scientific webinar and to ask some of you who is interesting uh, to gather all these things and to uh, inform uh, maybe uh, EU or NATO or the relevant, uh, relevant institutions what, what is actually the outcome of today our meeting because I have to remind you that there was a, 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 like 24 uh, participants out of 12 countries. So it is a small webinar, but uh, if you see the data uh, representing from 12 countries and how critical our discussion is, I think we, we can think of what we shall do next uh, as a next step in our gathering and uh, how to influence uh, our colleagues from uh, uh, scientific diplomacy to be more active, more talks, not, uh, not, not war, but more talks. So Gordon is the next on the line, please Gordon. Thank you, Darko. Thank you. I think I hope that you can hear me. Yes, you can hear me. Uh, it was very nice to be here and to be to all of you and to meet some of the new colleagues. I think, Darko, that in one month or uh, six weeks, seven weeks, we might organize a new webinar on the topics that are going to be a little bit closer to us and a little bit further for the from the distance for, for the other colleagues about the situation in Montenegro and Bosnia and Herzegovina because. This is the area where the proxy wars between the Russia and the NATO or the Americas are going to be run in probably the next day. So maybe this might be one of the topics that the colleagues that are not closer to this, to this area, but are familiar with this, with this international conflicts might be interesting, just, just as an example, because uh, we are here more than two hours and it went very, very fast. It means it was, for me personally, it was quite interesting. So thank you, Gordon. So just a few uh, announcements for the future. Uh, first of all, we have a deadline 25th of February for our Security Science Journal. 
who ever want to submit articles out of two last conferences on Mediterranean and Eth Ethiopian situation, it's open, of course, as well, out of this uh, 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 webinar, this is number one, and uh, we want to publish, uh, uh, we are now in third year of existence of our journal, and uh, Jan is smiling, he knows how difficult it is to start uh, with, with the new journal, but uh, thanks to Gordon, thanks to Shlomo, thanks to all of you writings, uh, we're going to apply for ERIC Plus for the first uh, indexation. Uh, actually, we have index Copernicus, but the first big indexation will be ERIC Plus in, uh, in our, our third year of existence. So what we are thinking about two next conference, one definitely uh, unintegrated territories in Europe, uh, particularly situation we will follow situation in Northern Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia as well, Bosnia and Herzegovina. So what will what is actually the, the issue will be the uh, conflict of uh, titans? How this reflects? What is uh, as Gordon is already smiling? Hybrid, uh, uh, hybrid, uh, not war, but uh, uh, hybrid. Uh, let's say. Uh, uh, operations uh, here from uh, from uh, Russia and, and elsewhere, and how to confront, uh, how to protect uh, to protect society out of that. And uh, of course, we are thinking uh, about one of the next uh, uh, our web webinars will be on nuclear security, uh, because we do have now enough our members from Enis and also a few more uh, members that they will join Enis uh, uh, certainly in the future, uh, near near future that we are thinking in to let's say in in these two directions. So if there is no more any comments and questions. I would like to thank all of you for your participation. And of course, if you have any idea, initiatives, we are here. Let's let's move together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.